The episode opens with a flashback, capturing the moment Franklin first encounters Irene in a bar. Their meeting is sparked by a serendipitous pool shot that Franklin uses as an opening to engage Irene in conversation. This marks the beginning of their relationship. Leaping ahead about half a century, the narrative catches up with Franklin and Irene, now an elderly couple deeply in love. Although Irene is confined to a wheelchair, their affection remains strong. Franklin assists her outside, aiming to share a view of the night sky together. They venture to a shed, where a hidden underground tunnel leads them to an unusual door. Upon entering, they find themselves mysteriously elevated to an interstellar viewing platform, as if transported among the stars. Franklin has observed Irene's growing desire to gaze at the stars more frequently over the last year. They visited their special spot a total of 865 times, with visits increasing since Irene's fall the previous year. Attempting to understand her insistence, Franklin finally confesses that he's grown weary of their regular excursions to the stars. He's ready to hand over their secret responsibility to someone else. However, Irene firmly believes that this mystery is theirs alone to decipher. Meanwhile, their neighbor Byron is suspicious that Franklin and Irene are concealing something in their shed, and he's determined to uncover it. The next morning, as they were driving away, Byron hurried to their car, but Franklin, who views him as an irritating busybody, didn't appreciate the intrusion. Later, while attempting to mow his lawn, Franklin brushes him off completely. Back at his house, Byron shares his suspicions with his wife Janine, who advises him to stay out of their neighbor's affairs, insisting it's none of their business. In the car, Irene suggests that Franklin could be friendlier to Byron, but Franklin dismisses the idea. Irene persists, encouraging him to cultivate friendships rather than focusing solely on her. Later, Franklin and Irene visit the hospital. Irene sees her doctor, who plans to run some tests as her symptoms appear to be worsening, although her exact condition remains unspecified. While Irene was with the doctor, Franklin went to run some errands. He then got a call from his granddaughter, Denise, and ended up going for lunch with her. She's worried about them, having heard from a neighbor that they're roaming around in the middle of the night going for strolls. Franklin passes it off as simply watching the stars, but Denise is not so sure. She's worried and broaches the idea of them leaving the house. Franklin vehemently declines. While Franklin is away, Irene seizes the opportunity to visit an old friend named Sadie at a care home. During her visit, she is disheartened to see Sadie's deteriorating mental state. Feeling the need to confide in someone, Irene shares her secret with Sadie, explaining that she's been on special journeys, but is also grappling with a serious illness. When Franklin returns to pick her up, they both look visibly exhausted, the relentless march of time eroding their mental faculties. This is particularly evident with Franklin, who is showing signs of sin forgetting essential tasks such as refueling the car and picking up Irene from the doctor's office. At their home, Byron is proudly showing Janine his new campaign sign, excited about his run for councilman. Janine suggests he could delay his campaign until next year, but Byron is eager to start immediately. After their conversation, Byron sneaks over to Irene and Franklin's house to snoop around. While investigating, he receives a text from Janine, prompting him to leave abruptly. Back at home, the conversation turns to the inevitability of death. Irene encourages Franklin to embrace life fully and consider moving on from their home should she pass away before him. After spending a pleasant evening together, Franklin begins to sing to Irene, but soon falls asleep. However, Irene is restless and ready to take action. She writes a note for Franklin, expressing her decision to take control of her situation while she still has the ability. In the note, she promises to see him again and leaves it by the chair as she prepares to leave the house. Irene intends to visit the Martian landscape on her own, a place they've often traveled to together. Just as she is about to leave, she discovers someone lying on the floor, struggling to breathe and desperately seeking her help. The next morning, Franklin is awakened by the sight of Irene crawling toward the house, breathing heavily. She urgently tells him that there's someone in the shed. With concern, Franklin grabs a hammer for protection and goes to investigate. Downstairs, he discovers a stranger doubled over in pain. Franklin immediately assumes the man is a junkie seeking refuge, but Irene senses something more troubling. Adding to the mystery, the man is covered in blood without any visible wounds. Concerned, Franklin decides to call the police. Officer Thomas soon arrives at the scene. He conducts a thorough check of the premises to ensure there are no immediate threats. Meanwhile, the camera subtly focuses on Franklin's back, revealing a patch of blood spatter on his right shoulder, a result of him carrying the bloodied stranger. As Officer Thomas prepares to inspect the upper floor, Irene pulls him aside for a private conversation. She confides in him that Franklin's mental state is deteriorating and that he might be seeing things that aren't there. Her intervention convinces the 
officer and he leaves the property under the assumption that the incident was a hallucination on Franklin's part. Meanwhile, the narrative introduces another subplot featuring Stella and her daughter, Tony. They are far from the urban hustle in the serene mountains leading llamas across the vast rolling hills, a stark contrast to the urban school environment Tony usually frequents. That evening, Tony welcomes Matthias to their house, believing this could be the beginning of a new friendship. However, unbeknownst to her, Matthias has an ulterior motive. He reveals that he was dared to visit what is rumored to be a haunted house and was offered 4,000 pesos to step inside, casting a shadow over their budding interaction. The local rumors swirling around Tony's grandfather's involvement in cultish activities have piqued the curiosity of the local kids, including Matias. This revelation devastates Tony, who had mistakenly believed that Matias's visit was the beginning of a romantic interest. When Stella arrives and finds Tony with Matias, she quickly intervenes and shoos him away. After dealing with the situation, Stella takes a secretive path to the back of an old church nearby. There, hidden from plain view, is a door that strikingly resembles the one found in Franklin and Irene's shed, suggesting a deeper, mysterious connection between the two locations. Locations. Back to Franklin and Irene, as the situation at their home becomes more dire, the stranger on their floor suddenly passes out and starts convulsively shaking. Irene, recognizing the symptoms from a past experience, suspects it could be related to a virus she once battled. She quickly sends Franklin out to get a refill of Tamiflu, hoping it might help. While Franklin is away, Irene takes the opportunity to sift through the stranger's belongings. She finds numerous gold coins and a photograph labeled Gabriel, suggesting a possible identity or connection. Connection. With the man coughing uncontrollably and in obvious distress, Irene decides to take matters into her own hands. She prepares a homemade remedy she hopes will alleviate his symptoms and begins to read aloud from a book she found among his possessions, trying to soothe him with her voice. Byron, eager to gather support for his councilman campaign, is out trying to collect signatures from the locals, but he's finding it difficult to get any cooperation. Spotting Franklin entering the pharmacy, Byron seizes the opportunity and approaches him for his signature. However, Franklin declines and hurries inside the pharmacy. Inside, Franklin encounters a new pharmacist who isn't familiar with him or his prescription history. To ensure everything is in order, the pharmacist decides to call the doctor for verification before dispensing any medication. The doctor, wanting to discuss the situation directly, asks to speak with Franklin. This unexpected complication adds another layer to Franklin's already stressful day. Stella, unable to find Tony inside their house, grows anxious and decides to search for her by car. She eventually locates Tony and decides to take her to a restaurant to talk and give her advice over a meal. Tony expresses her feelings of isolation and the mockery she faces from peers because of the mysterious reputation of their house. Stella responds by hinting at a deeper family secret, explaining that every family member is a guardian of something significant and assures Tony that she will understand her role when the time is right. Their conversation is abruptly interrupted when Stella receives a notification that the alarm at their house has been triggered. Alarmed, they rush back home to check on the situation Situation. Meanwhile, back at Franklin and Irene's place, the stranger regains consciousness and introduces himself as Jude. He's uncertain of his origins, but believes he might be from the mountains. Jude also recalls being carried, which Irene and Franklin assume must have been Franklin's doing, though Franklin has no memory of it. Upon returning with the Tamiflu, Franklin displays a cautious demeanor toward Jude. Unlike Irene, who shows concern and willingness to help, Franklin is reticent and distant, focusing more on Irene as she starts to feel woozy and faint, indicating his primary concern remains her well-being. Denise, who is struggling to stay alert during her lecture, is fortunately assisted by a fellow student named Cliff, who offers her a cup of coffee. This small gesture leads to a connection between the two. They went out for a drink, and she told him about her family, but that was not entirely the truth. She told him she has taken on the significant responsibility of looking after Franklin and Irene. He asked why her father couldn't do it, but she brushed it off, saying he is busy. Meanwhile, a tense conversation unfolds between Franklin and Irene. Franklin confronts confronts Irene about a secret she's been keeping concerning Dr. Maurice's advice. Irene agrees to follow the doctor's instructions, but in return, she asks for Franklin's support as she continues to investigate the mysterious doorway and its significance. Although hesitant, Franklin begrudgingly agrees to support her quest. After receiving the notification of the alarm, Stella returns home with a gun, only to discover that an old friend has broken into her house. The intruder questions whether Stella is training Tony, hinting at a connection to the same mysterious elements tied to the doorway. That night, after Franklin has warned Jude not to harm Irene, Jude finds himself unable to sleep. As Denise and Cliff are about to depart, she tells him that she had lied in their conversation earlier, and she told him about her personal challenges, including the emotional weight of her father's voluntary death.
death when she was just five years old. Jude quietly takes Irene's letter and stealthily moves through the house. Jude's actions take a startling turn when he retreats to the bathroom with a knife. There, he carefully cuts into his leg, revealing a strange cylindrical object embedded beneath his skin. It appears to be some kind of tracking device. Understanding the implications of being tracked, Jude decisively crushes the device, ensuring it can no longer function. After dealing with the device, he slips out into the night. Franklin delves into the mystery of the gold coins he found among the stranger's belongings. He takes them to a local trader who identifies them as Spanish doubloons, but the exact origin of their minting remains uncertain. Simultaneously, Stella confronts the intruder she found in her home. She sends Tony out and questions him about his presence. He responds by handing her a paper, describing it as a special assignment, and insists that she involve Tony. Meanwhile, Franklin, showing a gesture of care, returns home with a bag of clothes for Jude, the stranger who recently revealed his name. However, he specifically avoids giving Jude any of Michael's belongings, as the memories associated with them are still painfully fresh. Responding to Jude's simple request for food, they all head to a diner. The outing takes an uncomfortable turn when Jude becomes ill and vomits during the ride home. Denise is presented with a significant opportunity by her superior, Mark. She's been invited to join a newly forming research group, which promises a substantial salary increase, but also requires a hefty time commitment. This new role would not only be a step up in her career, but would also demand she manage it alongside her ongoing internship, essentially doubling her workload. Faced with the potential benefits and the daunting prospect of increased stress, Denise feels torn and unsure about whether to accept the offer. Throughout these events, fragments of Jude's past begin to surface in his mind. Mind. He recalls snippets of his life before arriving at the Yorks, including a conflict with another individual. Byron comes under fire for forging signatures on his campaign. He received a call and he was told to put his campaign in suspension to not face legal matters. Franklin, acting on Irene's suggestion, takes Jude out for some male bonding in an attempt to better understand the mysterious guest. They spend the day playing chess, a setting that gives Franklin ample time to evaluate Jude's character and intentions. Despite the shared activity, Franklin suspicions grow, and he concludes that Jude might be a con artist. Convinced that it's best for Jude to leave, Franklin decides to give him $5,000 to help him on his way and drives him to the bus station. However, as Jude prepares to board the bus, Franklin begins to have second thoughts about his decision. The complexity of the situation and perhaps a sense of unresolved doubt lead Franklin to reluctantly invite Jude back, allowing him another chance to prove his intentions and possibly clarify his mysterious connection to their family. At home, Irene makes a startling discovery among Jude's possessions, a mysterious orb that seems to have the ability to disintegrate matter. When she places it on the coffee table, the table vanishes without a trace, leaving her both amazed and alarmed. Meanwhile, Denise decides to visit her grandparents and encounters Jude, who they introduce as their new caretaker. Denise is skeptical of Jude, especially given the peculiar circumstances of his arrival and the strange incidents surrounding him. Although Irene suggests that Denise should head home rather than stay the night, Denise leaves but not without instructing Jude on her grandparents' needs and expectations. She opts to stay with a friend, driven by a resolve to uncover Jude's true identity. Later that night, Jude has a private conversation with Irene. He confides that he believes his presence at their home is no coincidence. Jude reveals that he is searching for his father, named Gabriel, the same name on the Polaroid found earlier, and he seeks Irene's assistance in this personal quest. In another part of the house, Franklin discovers a bloodied knife in the bathroom. While cleaning up, he notices fragments of the mysterious orb that Irene had found, now broken and swirling up through the sink. Unfortunately, the water quickly washes them away before Franklin can examine them further, deepening the mystery of the strange object and its capabilities. Byron, undeterred by previous accusations of meddling, finds himself unable to resist the lure of the mysterious activities at the Yorks' residence. Driven by curiosity, he sneaks into their property and makes his way to the shed. Inside, he navigates through the clutter until he confronts the secret door the very threshold that seems to be the heart of the enigmas surrounding Franklin and Irene. Meanwhile, the narrative shifts back to Stella and Tony. In a parallel scene reminiscent of earlier discoveries, Stella takes Tony to a secretive doorway located behind the chapel, a portal similar to the one in the York's shed, but with a distinct feature. This doorway is equipped with a strange control panel that Stella manipulates to set their destination. After entering a sequence of commands, Stella and Tony step through the doorway and find themselves instantly transported to New York City. 
The scene unfolds with Jude awakening from a distressing nightmare, where he's embroiled in a fierce fight with another man. Shaken, he decides to take the mysterious orb he discovered earlier and buries it outside to keep it safe. As he is digging, Byron appears, asserting that this is a private area. Jude, claiming his role as the caretaker, brushes off Byron's curiosity and leaves without divulging any further information. Meanwhile, Franklin's suspicions about Jude continue to deepen, especially after finding the bloodied knife. Determined to uncover Jude's true identity, Franklin visits Officer Thomas, hoping to persuade him to conduct a DNA test on the knife. However, Thomas dismisses the need for such measures, viewing Franklin's elaborate theories as further evidence of his deteriorating mental state. In another part of town, Jude and Irene visit a library where Jude searches through records and discovers that his father had been arrested due to homelessness and claimed amnesia at the time of his arrest. When Irene shares this information with Franklin, he responds with a lighthearted joke, suggesting that forgetfulness must run in Jude's family. Elsewhere, Stella and Tony are navigating their own mysterious venture with a contact named Nick. He leads them to an abandoned warehouse where a machine starts emitting what appears to be serial numbers. Nick explains that while he can help narrow down their search, he will need to accompany them to accurately pinpoint the source of the signal. Throughout this ordeal, Tony remains confused and uncertain about the overarching purpose of their mission, highlighting her struggle to grasp the full scope of their enigmatic activities. Denise finds a temporary respite from her demanding schedule by staying at her friend Katie's place. She wakes up there one morning and opens up about the extreme stress she's been under lately, finding comfort in sharing her struggles with a friend. Back at Irene and Franklin's home, tensions rise to a breaking point. Franklin, increasingly troubled by the unfolding events, accuses Irene of favoring Jude over him. Despite Irene's attempts to clarify her intentions and reassure him, Franklin remains skeptical about the situation and abruptly leaves the house, overwhelmed by doubt and frustration. In a parallel scenario, Byron, who has been actively campaigning for a council seat, reaches a moment of disillusionment. In a symbolic gesture of giving up on his political aspirations, he burns all his campaign signs. As he does this, he notices Franklin driving away. Byron tries to offer a friendly smile and greeting, but the moment is fleeting. After Franklin's departure, Irene confronts Jude about his secretive demeanor. She expresses her concerns about him not sharing details of his life, to which Jude responds with a pained smile, acknowledging her care despite his reticence. Chandra, a nurse who previously worked in the caretaker's house, arrives at Irene and Franklin's home under the guise of offering her freelance services. She reveals that she's now freelancing, though in reality, she was fired for stealing. When Irene informs her that Jude has taken over caretaker duties, Chandra asks to use the bathroom, handing Irene her business card to distribute to any friends in need of her services. However, seizing the opportunity, she sneakily enters Jude's room after her bathroom visit and steals something from him. Meanwhile, Jude handles a phone call with Dale from the pawnbrokers, who speaks about the significant value of the gold coins associated with Jude. Jude, pretending to be Franklin's son during the call, is visibly unsettled by the conversation about the coin's value. After the call, Jude contacts someone, possibly seeking advice or information about the coins. The conversation is cryptic, with the person on the other end uttering, Fiat Voluntas Dei, which translates to God's will be done, suggesting a deeper, possibly religious or philosophical significance to the coins. Shortly after, Irene comes by to pay Jude for his work and reassures him of her support, irrespective of the mystery surrounding him. However, after Chandra's earlier visit, Jude discovers that an item, a rectangular slab previously hinted at, is missing from his belongings. He quickly connects the theft to Chandra, snatches her business card from the dresser, and heads to the local bar presumably to track her down and retrieve his stolen item. At a local bar, a series of unexpected encounters and revelations unfold. Jude, who is trying to track down Chandra, ends up at the same bar where Denise and her friend Katie are unwinding. Denise approaches Jude, and they strike up a lively interaction involving shots and dancing. Meanwhile, Byron finds himself in a pool hall where he unexpectedly runs into Franklin. The two begin playing pool, and Byron confronts Franklin about a recent campaign stunt, suspecting Franklin had tipped off the authorities. Franklin firmly denies these allegations, and despite an initially frosty interaction, the two men find common ground. Franklin confides his fears about Irene's feelings toward him, while Byron shares his own personal struggles about feeling like a second choice to his wife, Janine, whom he describes as a consolation prize. Their conversation deepens, and both men, now heavily intoxicated, step outside the bar. Here, Byron admits he may have misjudged Franklin and probes about the mysterious doorway. Franklin, trying to dismiss it as merely a bomb shelter, is finally persuaded by Byron's persistence to show him the site. However, when they reach the supposed transportive shelter, it fails to operate, leaving Byron to laugh it
it off as a hoax, thinking it's just a bizarre construction. Simultaneously, Irene wakes to find Jude missing and decides to drive out to find him. As she searches, Jude, leaving the bar, is stopped by the police. The confrontation triggers traumatic memories of a past altercation where he had to defend himself, explaining the previously noted blood. As Irene drives past, she sees Jude face down on the hood of a police car, being detained, a sight that shocks and worries her about his fate. In the police station, Irene confronts a distressed Jude who has run off and now finds himself entangled in a legal predicament. Urging him to be honest, Irene demands the truth if she is to help him. Jude, finally opening up, reveals that he was held in an isolated compound designed to guard the secret of the doorway, an enigmatic portal leading to what he describes as a barren alien planet, not the symbolic gateway others might believe it to be. Jude further explains that the blood found on him was from an altercation with men who tried to prevent his his escape from the compound. The stakes are high as these individuals, should they find him, intend to kill him. Jude's ultimate mission is to locate Gabriel, who had previously ventured through the same mysterious doorway. With this newfound understanding, Irene manages to persuade the police to release Jude. On their way home, Irene attempts to downplay the significance of her own doorway. However, Jude insists that their doorway is part of a larger destiny, making it one of the most crucial portals among many. Meanwhile, the subplot with Tony, Stella, and Nick sheds light on the the scientific and mystical dimensions of the doorways. They discover that the doorways are connected by invisible particles that span vast distances. While Stella views this phenomenon as a divine gift, Nick adheres to a scientific interpretation. Their quest to locate a specific package leads them to a massive transmission tower. Nick breaks into the network to pinpoint the package's location. However, their operation is nearly compromised when a utility worker arrives. Thinking quickly, Stella subdues the worker, securing him to his van's steering wheel with cable ties. The Thus ensuring their mission continues uninterrupted. As Nick and Tony proceed to their next destination in Illinois, Tony remains quiet, still processing the events from earlier. Meanwhile, Denise visits Irene and Franklin's house while they are at the doctor's, intending to return a jacket Franklin left at the bar. During her visit, she casually inquires about Jude's father, sparking a light-hearted response from him. Their interaction is interrupted by Irene, who returns with positive news from the doctor. Franklin takes a proactive step towards proving the existence of the alien landscape by handing Byron a disposable camera with undeveloped photos and urging him to get them developed as proof. In another subplot, Irene and Jude visit Chandra's place to recover the items she took. While Irene distracts Chandra with fabricated concerns about Jude, he sneaks upstairs and finds both the strange black trinket and a necklace containing a similar device to what was on his leg. Confronting Chandra, she defensively claims the items were gifts from those at the care home. Irene, seeking further information, promises to keep Chandra's secret in exchange for the source of the necklace. This revelation links the necklace to the tracking devices, explaining why Jude was so keen to destroy the one in his leg. Byron, having developed the photos, finds evidence of the alien world, capturing images of Irene and Franklin in that setting. Meanwhile, Stella, in a distressing episode in the woods, experiences flashbacks of her mother's death, adding emotional depth and backstory to her character. Byron's curiosity leads him to research conspiracy theories online, where he discovers a reference to the impossible door, a concept sketched by an Argentine missionary in 1723, which he connects to their mysterious doorway. Back at the doorway, Franklin and Byron inspect the area and notice bloody fingerprints on the control panel, the same type found at Stella's portal. Upon opening the control panel, they realize the orb is missing, which Jude had previously buried. Byron, piecing together clues from his observations in the woods, locates the buried jar and recovers the orb, further entangling himself in the mystery surrounding the doorway and its secrets. The scene opens with a strained atmosphere at the dinner table, where Irene casually discusses teaching Jude how to drive. Franklin, however, remains detached from the conversation, his disinterest culminating in him excusing himself to take out the trash. During this mundane chore, he stumbles upon a letter from Irene, the contents of which shake his very foundations. Confronted with his feelings, Franklin accuses Jude of bringing turmoil into their home. Jude's retort, questioning the true source of the household's issues, leaves Franklin even more unsettled, prompting him to walk walk away from the confrontation. Meanwhile, in Illinois, Tony and Stella settle into a motel for the night. The situation escalates when Nick, having brought the orb with him, carelessly plays with it in the presence of a hired companion. Stella intervenes, dismissing the hooker and sternly reminding Nick of the peril they face, citing the tragic fate of his brother as a grim warning. Elsewhere, Byron, brimming with excitement, catches up with Franklin to discuss his discovery of the orb. However, Franklin, overwhelmed by personal troubles, dismissively informs Byron 
Byron that he's preoccupied with other matters. In a significant turn of events, Denise decides to quit school, a decision that has been looming for several chapters. Her friend reacts negatively, driving Denise to leave and join Jude on his quest. Jude shares new details about his father, Gabriel, who similarly had to cut a tracker out of his leg after escaping shadowy pursuers. Returning to the domestic front, Franklin, after spending a night at Byron's, confronts Irene about the discovered letter and her perceived broken promises. The confrontation underscores the deep fractures in their marriage, revealing a relationship in crisis. Concurrently, Byron attempts to operationalize the orb by placing it in the control panel in the basement shed. Despite his efforts, the mechanism fails to activate due to insufficient power. Tensions between Nick and Stella continue to simmer, with Nick provocatively mentioning Stella's late brother, Caleb. Stella reacts violently, punching Nick and leaving him with a bloody nose as she takes off with the van, stranding him at the motel. Jude, driven by the quest to trace his father's footsteps, decides to embark on a road trip to a remote area in Michigan. Denise, eager for the journey and the stories it may uncover, joins him. Irene, seeking a sense of adventure and perhaps a new purpose beyond her routine life, decides to accompany them, despite Franklin's decision to stay behind. For Franklin, their marriage and the life they built together have always been sufficient, but Irene yearns for more, highlighting a growing divide between their desires and aspirations. Back at home, Franklin handles unexpected business regarding the Spanish doubloons. He receives a call from Dale, the pawnbroker, who is eager to learn more about the origin of these rare coins. Franklin is bewildered, especially since it was Jude who initially dealt with Dale about the coins. Unable to provide answers and feeling confused, Franklin hangs up. This interruption is timely, as Byron urgently summons him to show him something new. Byron leads Franklin to the basement of the shed, where he has set up a large generator. His plan is to charge the circuitry connected to the doorway, hoping to provide enough power to activate it. They proceed with the setup, and the activation causes a massive surge of energy. The blast sends shockwaves through the neighborhood, disrupting electrical systems and affecting the natural environment evidenced by flickering lights and birds dropping from the sky. Simultaneously, Stella and Tony, who have been tracking related anomalies, receive a precise ping on their equipment indicating the location they need to head towards, spurred by the energy surge from the doorway. In the shed's basement, the power-up is successful, and Franklin and Byron find themselves transported to the alien viewpoint. They are greeted by a breathtakingly beautiful vista, a stark contrast to the mundane world they've left behind. Overwhelmed by the beauty and the surreal experience, Byron expresses a desire desire to explore further, but this time, Franklin, who has previously been apprehensive about such adventures, admits that he is no longer afraid. This moment marks a significant personal breakthrough for Franklin, reflecting his readiness to embrace the unknown. Franklin reveals to Byron the spacesuits he's been designing for years, but never had the courage to use. Inspired, Byron vows to help make them functional. Meanwhile, Irene, Jude, and Denise arrive in Michigan at the home of a woman named Hannah, who recognizes Gabriel from a Polaroid Jude shows her. She explains that she and Gabriel were once romantically involved, but he disappeared 15 years ago without a trace. Feeling their trip might be futile, Irene considers heading back, but Hannah persuades them to stay overnight. That evening, Irene hears a suspicious noise upstairs, but is reassured by Hannah that it's nothing. Unknown to the guests, Hannah enters a hidden room where a man named Paul is monitoring everything. They discuss making contact with Franklin after Paul plays a voicemail from him about the coins. Back home, Byron skips Janine's barbecue to focus on his project with Franklin. During a tense conversation, Janine admits she reported Byron's campaign forgery out of a desire for a simpler life, revealing a deep rift between their aspirations. Denise confronts Irene, feeling pushed away, and Irene admits she feels guilty about Michael's past struggles, believing she doesn't deserve Denise's love. Overcome with emotion, Irene apologizes, and they share a heartfelt embrace, understanding each other better through flashbacks of Michael's depression. Meanwhile, Tony finds a video of Jude singing karaoke which leads Stella to confirm that Jude is the apostate they've been looking for. Tony calls Nick for help in tracing Jude's steps. On another front, Byron and Franklin test the spacesuits they've been working on. Byron explores the alien landscape, excitedly communicating back to Franklin until he goes silent after claiming to have found something incredible. Left alone, Franklin fears the worst, struggling with guilt and concern over Byron's sudden disappearance. Irene takes Denise into the shelter to explain the turmoil she's been experiencing. She shares that after Michael's 
involuntary death. She struggled to find a reason to continue living and hoped the portal might help her cope with her grief. Irene confesses that her intention was to shield Denise from the portal's complexities, but Jude's arrival has caused events to spiral out of control. Feeling betrayed by the deception, Denise walks away, upset by the revelations. Meanwhile, Tony and Stella encounter Chandra in a sinister man on the shore. The man exchanges gold doubloons worth much more than the dollar 3,000 Chandra demands for information about Jude. After obtaining what he needs, the man abruptly kills Chandra, retrieves the doubloons, and warns that he will ensure Stella remains tough. He then sets Chandra and her car on fire, leaving Tony to witness the horrifying scene from a distance. Jude panics upon realizing the orb is missing from the garden. Meanwhile, Franklin searches for Byron on the observatory deck, but finds no trace of him, leaving both men distressed. Janine, worried, questions Franklin about her husband's whereabouts, but he reassures her without giving specifics. Inside, Jude confronts Franklin about the dangers of their endeavor, explaining that there's nothing but wasteland on the alien planet. Stella and Tony discuss their predicament, with Stella admitting they can't escape the man pursuing them. As the man leads Tony to the York House, noticing dead birds signals they're close, he reveals to Tony that Caleb is her father, not Stella's brother. At the garden, Tony finds Franklin held at gunpoint and forced inside. Meanwhile, Jude thanks Denise for her help at the bar, but their chat is cut short when Stella starts shooting, causing Jude to flee into the woods. Denise returns to the York House and finds herself and her grandparents also at gunpoint. The stranger coerces Irene into revealing the doorway's location, then heads to the shed. Irene comforts a distraught Tony who doubts their mission and condemns their actions, citing Chandra's death as a stark contradiction to their supposed divine mission. The stranger alters his plans and informs Stella, using the family as leverage to capture Jude, known as the apostate. Upon his arrival, Jude is assaulted by the man, hinted to have been sent by an unidentified woman, though details remain vague. During a scuffle, Franklin manages to overpower the stranger, who is then tasered, bound, and gagged. Stella and Tony, with the captive in tow, leave their old lives behind, driven away with a new bargaining chip. Simultaneously, Jude and Denise decide Decide to escape through the doorway to Bangkok, distancing themselves from the chaos. Irene resolves to limit their use of the mysterious doorway, dismissing its once-thought potential, which Franklin accepts with a mix of relief and determination to resolve unfinished business regarding Byron's fate. As Stella and Tony are ambushed and forced off the road by Hannah and her associates, the tension escalates. Hannah confronts Cornelius, the bound stranger, intensifying the conflict. Meanwhile, the couple embarks on another journey to an unknown alien planet. However, Franklin experiences a system failure in his oxygen supply, causing him to lose consciousness. Irene follows him, bravely entering the alien environment without a spacesuit to help him. It turns out the atmosphere of this planet is suitable for human life. She removes her husband's helmet, and together they discover an ancient city beyond the hill. It turns out that guardians of humanity have been living here for about 100,000 years. They are the ones who built hundreds of quantum portals on Earth and many other planets. This is where the first season ends. We were left with a setup for the second season, but unfortunately the series was cancelled. 